today our talk is Humanism in Action. <clears throat> Just a very brief introduction. Um, when I talk to my kids, they say, Dad, why do I have to join anything? Why can't I just be a good person and lead a good life as you taught me to be without joining? And of course, that's fine. But some of us do join for various reasons. I like being among humanists because they are like-minded people and we've interested in talks. And if you're a member of Shropshire Humanists, you have access to all these wonderful extra things. And I've joined Humanists UK because I strongly support their campaigns. And this is the main campaign divided into four different sections. I'm not going to talk about these. This is a very interesting talk in itself. And they make real inroads roads into that. So when you join something like QS UK, you're saying, this is what I believe, this is what I support. You're nailing your colours to the mast, you're standing up and being counted. And if you pay a subscription, or give a one-off donation, you're making a big difference to the success of these campaigns. But today we're talking about going a, a step further. Um, we're going to concentrate on three main areas of humanism in action. This is where you talk the talk, you walk the walk rather than talk the talk. So, firstly, in a minute, Maxine Beach is going to talk about humanist ceremonies. In fact, all three speakers do humanist ceremonies. Sue Falder is going to talk about non religious pastoral care. That's the sort of like the work of chaplains uh, in hospitals and hospices and prisons. Colleges and the armed forces. And she has experience. And I'll be talking about school volunteering, and I'll say a bit more about that then. Now, what we want to do is to show you how important these activities are, and they make a real difference to the lives of individuals. We want to show how important they are because they raise the profile of humanism. We want to show that they're actually doable, even with a busy life, because you can choose how much you do it, and when you do it, and where you do it. Some, like the volunteers, are volunteers and they don't get paid. The pastoral care volunteers, but mainly volunteers, but some actually after a period are given uh, part-time paid contracts by some hospitals or hospices. All the settlement work is fee-based, and for many settlements, it's a very welcome addition to their income or their pension or in some cases, it is their soul. We'll show you that the skills aren't hard to achieve, as the training is really excellent. And in the case of pastoral care and school volunteering, the training is completely free. The after-training support is extremely good as well. You're not just left to flounder. You're given a mentor. There's a huge amount of support if you have problems. And I was very daunted when I trained in all three of these areas. Uh, but skills I was taught in the Arctic care give me and the others who have done it a considerable confidence in doing it. Um, right. So I think I'll, I'll let um, Maxine take over now. So, um, my name is Maxine Beach and I am a humanist celebrant. That is what I do full time, that is my full time job now. Um, so, I thought for this talk, since we are sort of opening up debate about humanism in action, I would try and leave enough time at the end to answer any questions. So, I've left my presentation quite loose. I thought I'd just tell my story and give you a little insight into the things that I get up to as a humanist celebrant. Um, and then, I don't know if you have any questions or more, perhaps have a little bit of a discussion. I've actually, unfortunately, got to shoot off after this meeting, which is drive down to Cambridge, so I won't be able to hang around for very long afterwards. So hopefully, um, if you have any questions, then uh, do feel free to, to interrupt me if you want to. Um, I thought I'd put this slide up to start with um, and introduce this as possibly the best job in the world. Um, I am a little bit biased because <laughs> this is my job and I, can, I absolutely love it. Um, and I put job like that because in many ways it doesn't feel like a job. Um, celebrancy is something that you get 
very passionate about very, very quickly. Um, so in many ways it doesn't feel like a job. Um, but I actually only just got this um, testimonial through the other day. This was last Saturday's wedding um, on Anglesey um, with Holly and Damon, who are an absolutely fabulous couple. Um, spent a long time with them planning their wedding ceremony. And um, this came through just the other day when they said, um, uh, just wanted to know how much we appreciate the thought and I hope you've been to everything and what that meant to us. And I think that's really important that what we do as human celebrants is to create ceremonies that are very meaningful to people. Um, and as my dad says, lovely that are people like you in the world who care enough these things to make it their life's work, which I thought, I'm going to have to steal that one from my website, <laughs> frame it and put it up on the wall. Um, and so it's just a recent ceremony. So um, that kind of says everything about my job. Um, yes, you know, it, it you know, pays the bills, but it is so much more than that. Um, it is absolutely wonderful to get an insight into the lives of the people that you end up working with. So I do all three ceremony types. The three ceremony types are humanist wedding ceremonies, humanist baby namings, and humanist funerals. So um, I'm trained on those, but I'll reveal all shortly. Um, a question that you might have is, why do we need more celebrants, or do we need more celebrants? Maybe I'm standing here because we do need more celebrants. And the reasons are that most people still haven't heard about us. Most people don't know that they have choice when it comes to celebrating key life events and milestones in their lives. Uh, a lot of people who come to my ceremonies will come up to you after and say, that was just so different and so refreshing. I didn't know that I could do that. I didn't know that we could get married in our parents' garden. I didn't know that we could have a naming celebration that wasn't just a christening. I didn't know that I had this choice. And most people who hear about us tend to have heard about us through actually attending a ceremony. So it tends to still be quite word of mouth. So I very much believe that when we have more celebrants, more of us are available to take ceremonies. And the more ceremonies that we do, we are creating more demand because the people that sit in our ceremonies all of a sudden realise that that's what they want. And they'll come up to me and say, um, you know, go and take my funeral when the time comes or um, whatever it might be. So uh, people get very excited about it. Um, just pinpointing on the three ceremony types. So with wedding ceremonies, I don't know, the legal situation might be helpful. So, as the law stands in England and Wales currently, a human's wedding ceremony is not legally recognised. So what my couples will do is to usually go to the register office a couple of days before, maybe a couple of days after their humanist ceremony, and they will do what we call a statutory ceremony. It costs 45 to 50 pounds. They go in the room, they don't need to say their vows to each other, they don't need to exchange rings, they can wear what they want, they need two witnesses, um, they just have to say a contractual and a declaratory statement, and that is it. So it is the paperwork, I say it's like when you go to the bank to change your name, it's, you know, it's a formality. Um, and indeed it's the same case in many countries around the world, in France you still have to go into the register office to do the paperwork, and it's separated out. Um, another argument I like to put forward is that we don't tend to go and follow people when they don't sign a birth certificate or a death certificate. But we see a naming and a funeral or something quite different, so we split out the ceremonies there. So that's the current situation. Um, they are legal in Scotland. They're very popular in Scotland. They're legal in Ireland. As of this year, Northern Ireland and Jersey. And Jersey is going to follow, we hope, very soon. Um, we're always hopeful that the law will change in England and Wales. In fact, we don't actually need a law change. When the Marriage Act was amended to allow gay marriage um, in 2013, the um, government, David Cameron at the time, did actually put in an order-making power, which means that any subsequent government can activate this power, say the magic words, whatever it is, and legalise humanist wedding ceremonies. And it would be, as I understand, very straightforward. Um, it wouldn't need a change in law. So 
If this happens, or rather when this happens, it can happen quite quickly and we're doing quite a lot of campaigning behind the scenes. We are also putting together a legal case to challenge how unfair the law is in England and Wales that people who are humanists can't have a ceremony that reflects their belief system, but other faith groups can. Um, there's the potential for devolved marriage laws in Wales as well, and obviously we're quite close to the border. So, Basically, when this happens, there will probably be an explosion of demand. Um, and I think current celebrants probably feel the same, that um, you know, once this becomes legal, it will be in the news and people will hear about us a lot more. So weddings could become very popular very quickly. Um, what we're expecting is something like if I get my facts and figures right, after about sort of five or six years, we could be doing 25,000 weddings in London, something like that, if we're using the kind of Scottish model. So that's weddings. Naming ceremonies, um, I would say we need more celebrants because a lot of people still don't know what a naming ceremony is. And again, the more celebrants, the more people going out there pushing it. And it's the kind of ceremony where I think local advertising works really well going to mum and baby groups, posters and cafes, things like that, works brilliantly. Um, so training more naming celebrants would be great, so that people know that they have that choice. And a naming ceremony is essentially, it's a welcome to the world, a welcome to the family, to the community. Um, it's a great chance for people to assign, perhaps special people, guide parents, mentors, things like that, um, to welcome a baby into the world. But it isn't an initiation into the faith group, it's just a, a welcome. Um, so they're really, really lovely events, and again, it's still very much word of mouth. So um, it's only in the last year, I think, that we've been training naming celebrants in just one ceremony type. It used to be the case that you had to be <coughs> a wedding or funeral celebrant in order to take on namings, but now you can be trained in just namings if that's something that interests you. Um, funerals, um, it's a bit of a funny one. So we've been doing funerals, um, for a very long time, we've been doing ceremonies for 100, over 130 years. Um, but there's a slight feeling that the, the marketplace, for want of a better word, is sort of changing <coughs> the funerals. So traditionally, funeral directors have funerals <coughs> wrapped up. So you know, when somebody passed away, or um, you'd go to your FD and they would arrange everything for you. So the, cel the funeral celebrant would then have to get in with the FD and, and be on their sort of recommended List. Um, and there's been a lot of independent celebrants as well who are now taking on um, funerals. But there's a bit of a feeling among the celebrants that they're starting to get more interest in people who are doing direct funerals. So not necessarily just going straight to the funeral director, but saying actually again, we want some choice, we want something a bit different, we want a woodland burial, we want something else. Um, so it is changing a little bit. So I thought I'd just outline um, how I came to be a celebrant. Um, so this is where you can usually have me in a coffee shop, um, <coughs> generally working on scripts or meeting couples. Really embarrassingly wearing the same jumper that I wear tonight. I do have other jumpers. This is clearly my celebrancy jumper with my, uh, my two lovebirds when I'm thinking about weddings. Um, so I had a sort of humanist wedding um, seven years ago. I say sort of humanist because I'd read about humanism and found it quite interesting. But we also had a, a mutual friend um, called Peter who was very, very good at public speaking. And actually, we asked him because he knew us so well to be our celebrants. Um, but we utilised all the resources from um, what was then BHA, but now Humanist UK, on how to put a ceremony together. So we sort of created our own humanist ceremony and uh, absolutely loved the process of putting our own ceremony together and actually saying something that felt right and fitting for us in our situation. So, um, so, so we had that seven years ago. I did think about weddings then. I was a teacher, I was an RE teacher for seven years, and as part of that I was asked to create some resources on teaching humanism within the religion curriculum. And in that line I met up with a few humanist celebrants to find out quite what a humanist celebrant does. And the common theme was that they were all absolutely wonderful people. Just really, really genuinely warm, lovely friends, people who were clearly passionate about what they did. And that's really what inspired me. 
Um, that was Victoria Denning, it's her, her fault. Um, and that's what inspired me to look into actually training. Now, at the time, I was a bit worried because I thought, I'm, you know, I'm quite young, do I have the gravitas, do I have the authority? Um, will I get any work? Will it fit alongside teaching okay? But um, a few people gave me a nudge and I applied to do the training. I'm more than happy to take questions about the training, but uh, it takes place over several months, three or four months. You have residentials, you have assignments, you get observed, you get provisionally accredited, and then you get observed actually doing a real ceremony to get your full accreditation. So I went through the training process, which was highly recommended, really, really high quality training, and thought, well, this would be a nice little project, a little hobby to do on the side of teaching. I'll maybe do a couple of year and carry on teaching. Um, and in the first year, I did seven weddings. Bear in mind, people usually book their weddings um, 12, 18 months in advance. The second year, I had 37 and realised that there was a big demand for humanist weddings. And I had to make a choice between doing ceremonies and, and doing teaching. So I thought I've served my seven years. So, um, so I do this full time now. And this is a picture from my very first wedding with my very brightly dressed. Um, so this was back in 2015, no, 2014, that was 2015. So humans buildings, I thought I'd share with you just a few photos so you get a little bit of an insight into the kind of things I do. Um, a lot of them can feel very traditional. A lot of couples will come to you very excited and say, well, we want to, we want to have a human ceremony, we want something a bit different, a bit out there. And you start talking to them about their plans and seat and we're going to sit in rows and we're going to have an aisle and my dad's going to walk me down <laughs> and have a veil. Um, and you realise actually what they think is it's not necessarily they want something wacky and off the wall. Some of them do. I think my third wedding was a fancy dress one. First and only. Um, not because it was awful but it just so happened that um, no one else has asked. Um, they can be very, very different but the common theme is that they're very, very personal and you tell stories and people laugh. And actually, it's a really, really emotive, captivating event where family and friends, you know, you get to see them in absolute stitches, um, tears of joy. You can just use the space how you want to, so it's a little bit like creating a theatre. So I like to put my couple side by side because then their guard drops, they're in their natural habitat, they can hold hands, they can do what they do as a couple. And they can actually look at their family and friends as well and get their reactions and actually it's not just about a spectacle that everybody's witnessing and watching them, but actually everyone's a part of it. So they feel very, very inclusive. Um, they can be held in any venue because they're not legal currently, so you can have them absolutely wherever you want to. This one was supposed to be in the garden. This one was supposed to be... This um, bride's mother spent about nine months arranging her garden and planting things to be in flower at the right time and the weather was like today. We had no chance of having it outside but thankfully they had a, a really nice marquee. Um, this one was outside and the weather was great because this was in Yorker. <laughs> this was uh, mid-August this year. So you can do them abroad. It just depends where people want you to go. As I say, they can be very, very emotional, um, both in tears of joy and just Greasing up in the stitches. Um, and if this video works, this is actually a very old video, so the uh, problem is I make this video for my website and then cut my hair off. So people will see this video on my website and then when I go to meet them, they've got no idea who I am. Um, but I made this little montage of my, these are my 2016 weddings, so I've got to share it.
but um, you get the idea. I think the common theme is that we just have a lot of fun and you get to know the people you work with so well because you will meet with them and they will reveal all to you. Um, and many of them I've stayed friends with over the years as well. Um, namings I will run through briefly. I've kind of railed, reined in my, my naming ceremonies, um, so I've had a bit of a change this year. So we're doing weddings, but I felt that taking up all of my Saturdays with weddings and Sundays with namings was a little bit unfair on my own family and my own social life. So this year I made the decision, as much as I love namings, to step back from namings, and I've trained this year to do funerals. I haven't yet started them, getting the wedding season out of the way. Um, I haven't had the training, so in sort of end of next month I'll be looking at taking my first funerals. But again, wonderfully joyous occasions, again, held in any location you want to. They might be tea rooms, they might be a family home. Um, this was for little Teddy, um, he was super cute. You can involve, the, this isn't the parents, these are the guide parents. So it's giving other people, as I say, a special role in that child's life. Um, and they're very relaxed affairs as well. You never quite know, you don't know what's going to happen at an aiming. You've just got to be able to think of your feet sometimes. The very first naming I did, um, gorgeous little baby who decided to throw up five minutes before the end. Um, you just have to go with it. So sometimes we just put them out on play mats, have toys around. It's not stuffy, it's not formal, they haven't got to sit somewhere. They do what they want to do because it's about them and they will absolutely steal the show. Um, this is little Paloma who is watching her granddad sing her a song, which was absolutely lovely. Um, and as I say, I don't have any photos um, of funerals, but this is a natural um, burial ground in Wixall. So not too far from home, I know there are other ones around. So again, just looking at sort of different possibilities for funerals and also memorial services. So again, some, some people are doing sort of direct cremation um, where you you just have the cremation and then you actually have the service and the memorial somewhere else, somewhere different. You have more time, it's more relaxed. So there are again lots of options around that. So where I run out of time, I thought I would take any, if we have time, if yeah. anybody has yeah, any definitely. questions at this stage, please fire away. Um, yeah, you, you were saying about the marketplace, the inverted commas, changing for funerals. If you could sort of fast forward 10 years and the changes you're seeing kind of accelerated, what, what would be the big changes you would see? Oh, good question. I mean, this is, as I say, I've only just trained in funerals, so and this is all anecdotal. I sit on the marketing committee for um, humanist ceremonies, so that's how I have a bit of an insight into how things are changing. Um, I think potentially people are going to be taking control. You know, you know, in the same way that we used to go to the travel agent who would take care of everything and they would book on our flights and our in flight meals and our transfers and our accommodation and everything, I don't know, it would be packaged, and, and they'd put a fee on top to do that. That's essentially what funeral director is doing. They're, they're just putting together a package for you. Whereas now we live in a society where it's much more pick and choose. We can browse all of our supplies on the internet. Um, we often choose people that we want to work with, especially somebody as personal as a celebrant. So I think potentially in the future people are going to be doing that a lot more and actually choosing things themselves and, and tailor making funerals. We are starting to see a lot of pre-need meetings, which is somebody who is going to die. Um, and they are taking responsibility for their own funeral planning. So you can meet with them um, actually in advance of their death. Um, yeah. some of the so there might actually be a, a different type of funeral director than some mm -hmm. the one that maybe doesn't have the same type of solemnity that we see at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And, and they are popping up all over the place. Yeah. That's the big issue. And I'll uh, just add to that, I think there's, I'm right in saying, there's an investigation at the moment into the funeral industry by the government or some um, authority. So I think it's likely that um, prices are going to be carefully looked at and possibly pegged and that sort of thing. So it, things, as Maxine says, you know, are going to change for funeral directors as well. Just another funeral question. On the, in the cases where you do actually have a, a body, are you not constrained to have them in um, uh, you know, a normal um, chapel? No. Um, oh. 
crematorium. crematorium. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm yes. all the, you know, yeah. uh, This is surprisingly few regulations as I understand it, actually about what we do with our dead. And we are just very linked, it's become very institutionalised and very medicalised. And we think that it has to go in a certain type of vehicle and we have to stop them in a certain way. But there are FDs um, who are actually starting to say, take them home, take people home. Look after them yourself. Take them to wherever. Do, oh, do you mean in terms of if you want a cremation, you have to go to a crematorium? Is that no, right? so, well, I'm saying initially, the location comes straight to there. But in terms of actually including money, I'm aware that there are quite um, uh, strict regulations on the You can't just bury the body in the dark. Yeah, you can. You can, but you still have to be there on the Yes, it has to be. So, so many feet from a water course. No, but it also has to be the pair. Yes. I've changed yes. conditions. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, but it is. And again, people don't don't realise that. Yeah. I haven't yet, as I said, just trains. Um, and one of the reasons that I put it off is because I wanted to finish the wedding season because I know once I go to funeral directors, if they send me work and I decline it because I'm still working on weddings, they probably won't want to use me again because I'll be unreliable and inconsistent. So I wanted to make sure that I timed it because I'm also going to California for three weeks. So I wanted to time it so that I know that I'm ready and available. Um, but it will be a case of, I've actually, before I trained, I phoned up my local funeral directors um, and they established that people are asking for human funerals and there aren't any where I live. So um, I, I know that there is demand there. You mentioned the training and assignments. Could you say a brief word about what kind of assignments you do with people facing these? Yes, absolutely. Days? So um, the training happens over three weekends. We have a one day induction day and then two residential weekends, and they're spaced out sort of roughly sort of one a month for, for three months. And you have um, assignments in between them. So the assignments might be, you've had an email inquiry about a wedding. How would you respond to it? And then it's very much based on script writing. So once you've actually started the training, you look at how to put a script together, whether that's for a, a funeral wedding or name to wedding. And they're all bespoke. Each one is written from scratch. There's no templates, there's no stick names in, there's no copy and paste. Um, so these assignments tend to be about this is the situation, this is the information about the couple or about the deceased or about the baby. How would you write that script? So that's what it tends to be. And then you get to do some role playing and things like that as well. Is there any family opposition? People phone us and has made a decision. Well, it's a couple getting married or a funeral, and it's against what family would want, particularly a funeral. Is family opposition, can that override the person's wishes? Yeah, so with weddings it's fairly straightforward. Occasionally yeah. you'll get some family members that aren't happy that it's not in a church or, or don't quite understand it. Um, they're usually the ones that will come up to you afterwards and say, that was amazing. Um, that changed my mind. With funerals, it can be tricky, and of course, you have to think about who your client is. You know, your client is, is not the deceased, your client is usually the next of kin, yeah. um, and you have to go along with your client's mission. And yeah, it can cause tensions, often not. Um, it, you know, it is a rare case, but sometimes you do have disagreements that have to be sorted out within the family. Okay. Well, that's just one more question. Yeah. There's any other? Okay, well, thanks thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Sue Fowler, come and tell us a little bit about pastoral care. Uh, so, um, in 2009, uh, I went on a, a, a trip with a small group of humanists to Belgium to have a look at uh, what Belgian humanists do uh, and uh, they do a lot. We, we saw how they deal with ceremonies, very interesting. I was, I was a celebrant, I am a celebrant. Um, but then we looked at their pastoral work. We went into a hospital where the humanist counsellor will, um, will 
be responsible for talking to people who are thinking uh, along the lines of euthanasia, which of course is legal in Belgium, so they, they are the people who sort of deal with that. We went to a, a residential home where there was a, what you could call a chaplain, I suppose, or, well, he was a full-time person who used to do very much what we would do for uh, ceremonies, you know, write um, the story of the people's lives, and that was a real benefit to them um, in terms of, you know, feeling that they recognised meaning for themselves. Um, we went to a prison and spoke to uh, a chap there, and went round the prison. Uh, what else did we do? I don't know, but the other things they do are they are part of peacekeeping operations. They are um, they are active in universities and colleges. They support fishermen. They work in airports. You know, they are everywhere. It's a different system, and uh, there's a lot of money for various reasons sloshing around the humanist in Europe, but particularly in Belgium. So it was quite different, but at the time there was, as far as I could tell, there was no will within um, the humanists, BHA as it was, to do anything similar, which I felt disappointed about. But indeed, uh, in 2013, by 2013, they were ready to start their first training course for pastoral volunteers. And I went on that first course, there were about eight or ten of us, I think. No, probably about eight. That was in 2013. Now it's 2018, and there are 250 pastoral volunteers with the network um, working in uh, most uh, mostly well uh, a third in NHS trusts fifth, uh, well let me put it this way a third of NHS trusts have now got a non-religious pastoral volunteer in them and um, fifteen percent of prisons have and there are, as Simon mentioned earlier, that non-religious people are being accepted for paid positions within chaplaincies now. We have just had, uh, which you may have picked up in humanist information, we have just had appointed a humanist full-time managing chaplain in a hospital in Leicester. Um, and, and there are other paid uh, humanists in, certainly in, in other hospital, hospital chaplaincies. Um, one, one in prison, one in prison. So, so how is that network run? Um, Humanists UK has been campaigning and they have somebody, Simon O'Donoghue, who is the head of the, of the um, pastoral care network. He negotiates with the heads of the chaplaincies of prisons and the heads of the chaplaincy of uh, the NHS. And he fields requests which are coming in constantly from um, different areas, which I'll mention in a bit, for non-religious people to be available. And he also, importantly, monitors adverts that go out from institutions who are looking for um, ch chaplaincy volunteers or paid chaplains. And he, if, he, if those adverts uh, are not inclusive of non-religious belief systems, he will negotiate with them. Uh, he will write legal letters to them 
to uh, encourage them to make their advertisements more equitable. And at the moment, there are uh, 14 institutions actively looking for non-religious pastoral carers uh, in mental health um, and other chaplaincy and, and six prisons, uh, including one paid one, looking specifically for non-religious carers. So why is it needed? I, 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 maybe amongst us, as it were, um, it seems an obvious question, but there should be equality of provision uh, for those who are in hospital, for those who are in prison, and for anybody else who wants to speak to somebody and uh, wants to actually speak to somebody who has the same kind of belief system uh, as they themselves have. It, it may seem self-evident to us. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, it is a, a, a legal requirement, but um, for those who have been established in chaplaincy for a long time uh, and, and traditionally um, managing chaplains have been CV, um, and, and many of them are very, very nice, of course, uh, and, but they will all give you the same answer. They will all tell you that people of no faith and any faith are dealt with by them uh, and they have no prejudice against them. Um, and they do not see, really, they do not always see, or have not in the past always seen, the argument for having uh, humanist or non-religious people in the work. And of course, the other thing that is important, I think, for, um, for us is that in terms of public knowledge, it should not just be felt that caring is for the religious. It's the province of the re religious religions. Um, because, of course, it's not. Um, so, it's important, uh, and it's happening. It's definitely happening. So, what, what do you do um, if you go into pastoral care, become a part of the pastoral care network? Um, each chaplaincy is run differently. Some are still quite traditional, others are very welcoming to non-religious people. Um, they, they, they're all different sizes, obviously. St. Guy's and Thomas's in London has a chaplaincy team of 12, 12 full-time chaplains. Our local hospitals, Shrewsbury and Telford, have got one and a half chaplains between them. So you can imagine they're run in rather different ways and the sort of formality or informality of the organisation is, is very different. Um, and I spoke to somebody who is in a, a large um, chaplaincy uh, where uh, when they've seen people they have regular meetings uh, which he called, uh, we have, well, he said, we have handwritten patient notes for the chaplaincy team that we complete uh, and we feed back in reflective practice sessions. Um, hello. Which sounds absolutely ideal uh, and what you would want. Uh, other, other, other places have chaplaincy meetings which are all about organisation uh, and bureaucracy. Other, others have no chaplaincy meetings at all or any feedback. You know, it, it varies. But what, what do you do if you're in an NHS trust and you've been accepted to be part of the um, a pastoral carer? You go and talk to people. In some trusts you might be directed to certain 
people who have expressed the fact in some way, recorded the fact in some way, it doesn't happen in all hospitals that they are non-religious, but mostly you would probably find yourself um, introducing yourself on a ward and going to visit patients and gradually over time getting yourself known by the staff on the ward um, who would then begin to say, well, there's a lady over there who I think it would be good if you went and had a word with her today. Um, and gradually it builds up that you are known as a non-religious, usually a chaplain, um, and, and, and you become a part of that system, whatever that system is. Obviously, it's, it's Sorry, wrong room. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, one of the things I did when I was going into Telford Hospital was that I got some um, material into, into the uh, chapel uh, about humanism and, and, a, and a mention in the leaflet uh, that, they, that they, they give out. So that's quite important as well to, um, to actually, uh, you know, publicise the fact that there are non-religious people available and um, possibly in the future, and, and it, that is happening in some places, um, people who are also celebrants and, and chaplains can do uh, public funerals for people who haven't got any relatives or, um, or do some funerals for babies who have died. Those are the kinds of extra things that, that you may be called on to do. Um, if, you, if you were to go into a prison, uh, again, of course, it would differ, but you might go in as part of the chaplaincy team and go in for a regular amount of time every week and join in the work of the chaplaincy, which might be going to see people who were um, in solitary confinement, might be going to meet people who just joined the prison and make sure they know what happens in the chaplaincy. Um, it might be helping prisoners with bereavement in some sort of way or with family problems. Um, those are <coughs> the sort of daily work of the chaplaincy and they act as a, a channel of communication for families to prisoners. Uh, what I did when I worked in Stafford was, was rather different. I started off by going in to see one particular person who was a humanist and um, asked specifically to see a humanist. And um, I saw him for a, quite a while and then we decided together to try and start a group, a humanist group in the prison. And, uh, and, and that that group was quite successful um, and you might ask who came to it. Many people came to it just as many people come to humanist meetings, people who most of them have never heard of it. Many of them were not religious, some were vehement atheist, some were religious, had been brought up in religious homes, a, a variety of people just the same as any other humanist group really. My, my claim to fame was that somebody who came to the group for two years, well it wasn't a claim to fame but it pleased me, um, that, that somebody who came to the group for two years and was an adamant atheist and didn't want to be called a humanist, uh, when he, just before he left, uh, to go to another prison, he, he said, I would call myself a humanist now. Mm. <laughs> so I thought that was an achievement, actually. <laughs> anyway, um, we, we had a, a, a weekly and then it was a fortnightly session 
where we, obviously I tried to convey things about humanism to them. I had some information which I'd actually written, you know, little leaflets and humanism in brief, which is jolly difficult. Um, and um, those were about, books were there for them to borrow uh, and so on, if they were interested. And, and, but, but mostly, and I tried to look at current events uh, and subjects which had a slightly ethical sort of stance that we could uh, try and look at, uh, you know, in a, in a rational and, and thoughtful way. Uh, and um, just as an example of a few that occurred to me, that, that the baby Charlie in, in, in Alder Hay, remember, you know, that case we you know we talked about about that uh, Noel Conway of course and with his um, challenges about uh, about assisted dying um, drones in warfare and robots taking over work uh, uh, I used to take in pictures from the news and we'd look at them and and I'd try to draw out you know. Um, challenging things like begging and, and that sort of thing and see, see what people thought. Some people were uh, not very rational, um, but on, on the whole, they were very thoughtful and, uh, and interesting and interested. We, we sometimes watched a TED talk, I expect you know about TED talks, um, a very good one about emotional first aid sticks in my mind that you know went down well and we discussed it afterwards. We, we used some of Simon's talks from Radio Shropshire um, on, on different themes which I, I tried to um, pull out. We, we listened to music. I, I used to bring in music that they, that they liked, poetry. Some of them wrote poetry. We looked at some poetry. Uh, and I, with the help of the, this group actually, um, provided books for the prison library, which were read, and for a, a small chaplaincy library as well, uh, and got the, the new humanist magazine to go into the prison as well. So um, I did what I could. We had special days, which I must mention, and special days. Um, each, each religion in prison is allowed so many celebratory, celebratory days. And they are allowed special food, special foods, special activities, and um, extras. And, uh, so, of course, we needed some humanist days. So we landed on World Humanist Day. We had Darwin Day and we had um, Human Rights Day. Those were the three. We, we could have four, but I thought those three were all right. And um, we, you know, I tried to provide stuff that was relevant. On, on the Human Rights Day, we used to, they used to write. Um, to prisoners of conscience, they, you know, the, the amnesty right for rights um, thing that they do. <laughs> we did that. So, various things like that. And I will just read to you um, some things that were written on cards when either they left or when I left, uh, so I gave up last year. Um, just to, to show that um, it had some effect. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for facilitating the intellectual breaths of fresh air that was the humanist group at HMP Stafford. I always look forward to them, and not just because of the biscuits. <laughs> the biscuits were quite important. Thank you for all the kindness and support you've shown me since we met. It's been able, great to be able to speak to someone who doesn't judge, and someone I can have an intelligent conversation with. It's been very helpful, this is somebody else, having a group of people who can meet together with whom 
to talk about things outside this box, you have helped provide a much needed release. But you have also enlightened and enriched my mind on the topics of life, death, and humanism. And for that, I'm very grateful. Somebody else said, thank you for keeping it real. And for this bit. And a couple of short ones. Thank you so much for accepting me into the group. I hope this will be the beginning of a lifelong change in thinking for me. And the last one, you have really helped to ease this difficult part of my life. So there. Really worthwhile. <laughs> just, you know, it just, it just does feel worthwhile, obviously, when you get comments like that. Um, so other areas where, where non-religious pastoral caring is needed and is being requested. Um, in the armed forces, uh, very much individual efforts at the moment, I think, within the armed forces to, um, to provide alternatives to something that is very, very established as religious, religious chaplaincy, but um, it, it's there. Universities, such as this one, um, there are one or two people, again, it's rather individual efforts at the moment, but um, one or two people who are connected with uh, student welfare and who are running here or, or run a humanist group. Um, it's sort of easier in, in a university because it's not a, a government institution. They're all, they all organise their own finances and things, so well, I don't think finance comes into it, but you know, they, they, they are separate um, bodies. Um, and obviously if you work in, in one, <laughs> it helps as well. There's been a, a, a project recently, the, um, the, the regional organiser of the Canal and River Trust got in touch with, uh, um, with the, 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 BA, the BHA, Humanist UK, uh, because a lot of people live on canal boats <coughs> and some people live on their own and are very lonely and very isolated and can get ill and might not want anybody religious coming near them. And that, that is a situation which is crying out really for volunteers. And, and negotiations are in the pipeline for getting that going, certainly in this area. Um, there's been a request for non-religious people to be part of crisis response teams. Obviously we're not big enough to field a team, but we could link up with others. Um, there was an interesting request recently from an arts group who had, I don't know, you may have heard of this film, I'm sure you know about it. Um, a film called The Institute, which was when a group of scientists were put, do you know about it? Were put into, I've left all the information at home, I was going to bring it. Um, they, were, they recreated a place that was called the Something Institute in Soviet Russia in the 1950s, where scientists were all kept, um, more or less, under guard, I think. And they've, they put modern day scientists into that situation. Everything was as it would have been, and the demands were made upon them, and the restrictions were put upon them that would have been put at the time. And it, it was made into a film, and this film is apparently quite disturbing. And um, when people come out of the film, they are given the opportunity for counselling. And the request came through to Simon for non-religious um, 
volunteers to, to be involved, and that was all happening in London, so um, I didn't volunteer, but uh, an interesting, it's just interesting, the areas in which um, we are, we are um, being requested. So, um, if you want to join a chaplaincy team, or if you want to become a volunteer, um, you know, if you want to join a chaplaincy team, you, are, are, you need endorsement from your faith group. Uh, and in order to get that as a humanist, you would go to a humanist training course. Uh, and uh, the training course is just over two full days of training in London, um, where you have talks and discussions and, and uh, role play. Uh, and um, there are, there's a great range of people. A lot of people, of course, already have some kinds of experience which are relevant. Um, but there is a great range of people and everybody is very supportive. And after you've trained um, and been accepted and got your certificate, you, there are, are webinars, uh, seminars over the web um, with case studies that can keep you in contact with other people and uh, give you support. So there is a lot of support. Um, just the last couple of things I want to mention, there's a, a, a parallel sort of course which is organised by the Free Churches, which has been going for some time. It's called Starting Out in Healthcare Chaplaincy. Uh, and it, some people have been to that as well as the humanist one. It has the advantage that they will find you a placement because, of course, they have a lot of contacts around the place. And <coughs> last of all, um, I will mention, if any of you are already experienced in counselling, uh, you might be interested to know that there is a Masters in Existential and Humanist Pastoral Support, which is a programme uh, enrolling set up with the new School of Psychotherapy and Counselling and it gives you direct routes to management roles in pastoral support settings and by the end of it you would be a fully accredited funeral, wedding and naming servant as well. So if you're interested in an MA um, in existential and humanist pastoral support and you already have a lot of experience then that might interest you. And the next humanist pastoral care training course is in Newcastle in December and applications are being accepted now. Sorry I've gone on and on. Yeah. you would know, for instance, if you've been on a training course, you would, 
you would probably know other people who've been on the train before spinning. I mean, that's what I would do. I would use colleagues in that circumstance. But obviously, it's something you would have to monitor for yourself. Yeah. So, so where do you sit in between counselling, social work and advocacy? Yes. Well, yes. I mean, you're not an advocate. Uh, so you don't like no, no. I don't, well, I, I don't so think so. You're right. Would the defending describe it? Um, would what describe it? Defending. Defending. Well, yes, probably that's that's what you would say you were doing. Yes, yes, yes. I would, I would say that. So I might get a phone call from a head of an RE, uh, 
ask them for help with their Maori teaching. Now, if I haven't met them or been to that school before, I would go in and meet the teacher and sit down with them so they realise that I'm a pretty benign guy, I'm not an angry atheist, I'm not against religion, and I will present humanism for what it is, it's positive values rather than bad mouth religion. Uh, and the topic that I might be asked is, what is humanism? And I'd also need to find out who I'm going to talk. So 15-year-olds, not easy 15-year-olds. This is uh, also called Year 10, Key Stage 4, is a technical term to try to learn. And you find out how long you're going to talk for, uh, 40 minutes or 15 for questions. So what would I do? Well, it's very easy, because the Humanist UK have a, 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 a program called What is Humanism? Uh, with PowerPoint and everything. So what I'd do is I'd use this. This is the beginning of the PowerPoint. And I'll just show you the slides. Far more slides than you'd use in 40 minutes. If you just use the red ones, it would be about the right time. But you can pick and choose, because some of the subjects are dealt with a little bit more or a little bit less. So you can actually tailor it to what the teacher's interested in, and what you're interested in, what you feel will work well for you. So this is how it might go, so for 15 years. So you say, Okay, so we're all human. Um, so we're all human, and um, we, you know, we talk about what's important to us, human values, uh, and, and so on. Uh, with each slide, there is a little text that comes, comes with it. Which you can, if you want, use to speak, but it's actually just more an idea of giving you ideas, or if they ask questions, to, to answer them, to develop the sort of themes on each slide. We talk about human creativity and, and how uh, we value science. Uh, science has produced many wonderful things, it's meant to produce some things that aren't so good as well. And we talk about um, you know, empathy and compassion as well. What it means to be a humanist. So, there's a series of slides that go on. Oh, are we religious? And we maybe have to discuss with them what religion is, what it means, and so on. So that's, that's just the beginning of this series of PowerPoint slides that could be used for talking about humans. It's very easy. Now, another example. Now, I get a phone call from Hilary. I haven't met them. I, I meet them again. Now, this one wants we need to talk about secularism, and it's for 17 year olds, so the, the lower six. Now this is great fun, because once they're in the sixth form, they're much less belligerent, they're more engaged, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's great. And up to all, it's quite short, 30 minutes, 20 minutes for discussion. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a module called Secularism and Society, and I just need to Take you through the the um, this is the humanists' home page. You probably recognise this, and along the top you've got some pull down. So if you click on the education one, you get this pull down thing, and we're going to go for the teachers. And if you do that, it goes straight to understanding humanism, RE teaching resources, and this is a fantastic resource for information about humanism and teaching humanism. And this is the home page for understanding humanism. Now it looks a bit busy, but actually it's quite simple. I'll just point out a couple of things. This is a book, um, it's a, some copies on the back over there, uh, called and What is Humanism? It's a very lively book, lots of pictures. It's mainly to primary schools and perhaps some of the younger uh, secondary school pupils. But look, across the middle there, you've got different age. That's the book. And it's free to every school. And it's easy to get extra copies and give them to teachers if, if you want. They, they do appreciate it. So, if you look across the middle there, you've got different age groups. You've got this age group, and if you click on that, you'll get the sort of subjects with, for which you have teaching resources. What is humanism? The need for knowledge, meaning and happiness. These are for quite young children, and the presentations are quite simple, but interesting. So the older age group, you also have ethics, and you might have uh, atheism and agnosticism. Uh, getting a bit older now, we're coming on to secondary school. Life and death, ethics, meaning and happiness. Slightly older, uh, other subjects as well. And then you get on to the sixth form, 
And there are less subjects there, but what you do have is something called human perspectives. So let's just look at that. This is Get a Humanist View on Life's Fundamental Questions or in a Contemporary Ethical Debate. Many of our perspectives also contain presentations, questions, ideas for activities, and links to further resources and information. So these are the various things that in the little squares there, but I've written out the, the topics on the other side, and there are others as well. And you can see there are uh, modules for teaching about controversial things like uh, assisted dying or euthanasia, as they call it on this one, environmental issues, vegetarianism, abortion, uh, theodicy, the problem of evil, and so on. So, what I was looking for was something on secularism. So, let's go back and click on this one. And we get secularism in society. Click on that. So what is the humanist vision for a better world? What kind of society do humanists strive for? What is secularism and why is it important to humanists? Find out what humanists work for and what lies behind their motivation. So we click on that and we get this. There's a huge amount of resource here. And it's probably pretty difficult to see, so I'm going to enlarge some of it. So the top two there, these are a series of short videos and films and some of the cartoons. Quite a few of them by Andrew Copson. They're really lively, really interesting. You show them, they last about sort of five minutes, and then you discuss them on various aspects of secularism. If you go to the bottom here, we've got more films on the, on the left, uh, and uh, some really interesting ones. You've got The Harm Principle, John Stuart Mill, you've got The Veil of Ignorance, uh, which is all about John Rawls' uh, uh, theories, Stephen Pinker. And, so on. and then on this side here, you've got a document uh, written by Richard Norman, a prominent, uh, an internationally prominent humanist philosopher. And he's written this article, which runs into several pages, uh, and these are the sort of topics on it. Now, if you were to read this, it's very readable, very interesting, you would know ten times, hundred times more than the pupils, and probably three times more than the teachers. So, when you say, oh, I'm going to go and talk about secularism, you've got the, absolutely, you've got more than enough for a class there. Uh, and if they're uh, difficult to engage, you can show videos, and you'll know a lot about it. And it, so I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, when I first started going to schools, I thought, well, I know a bit about humanism, but what if they ask difficult questions? But this, is, this makes it much easier. Now, my third example, this is a sort of, sort of nightmare example. You get a phone, phone call to come in, and you arrange to me, if not, and they want to talk about how do you know what's true? Now, that's a nice subject. That's what we call epistemology, the theory of knowledge. Now, I'm very interested in that as a scientist. But, thanks to 11 year olds, and the teacher says, they're a lively class. <laughs> <laughs> that means they're either going to sit there and glum, or they're going to be totally out of control, with very little in between. So, I, I, sort of, I quite enjoy this. <laughs> so we've got 30 minutes and 20 for discussion. So what I'll probably do is I'll sort of make something up. This is, this is sort of what I'll do. <clears throat> okay. So I'll take them through it a little bit. I'll, I'll say, well, what do we mean by when we believe something, when we have faith in something? Well, I say, well, basically to believe something is to say you think something is true. Uh, there may be evidence, there usually is, but there may not be, but it's basically sort of a statement you think something is true. Faith is to say something is true when there really is either no or insufficient evidence. And to have blind faith is to say something's true when there's clear evidence to the contrary. So I they understand that and say, okay, so let's do this. What's that? Uh, two and two, theory of evolution, the sun is hot. Well, I think we all believe those. And there's good reason to believe those because there's good evidence. So that's that's belief. And then belief in God, belief in alternative medicine, belief in miracles. Well, uh, there is either no evidence, or I would consider myself insufficient evidence to believe in those, so I would say that was, uh, that was a faith issue. Uh, and then, of course, you've got belief in the flat world creation. <laughs> all the shows we will win the cup, <laughs> and I think there's very good evidence that those are not true. So you can establish that, okay? And then you say, well, humanists obviously, uh, we believe that everything can be explained naturally, without the supernatural. We look at the facts, we think hard, and we make up our own minds. That's what humanists do. So let's, let's do this. Now we're doing it. I say to them, you're on a jury, okay? 
and there's a guy in the dock being accused of murder. So if you get the kids to shout out answers, as soon as they're shouting, they start misbehaving. They start hitting each other and throwing things. So you mustn't let them speak. At least if any of you are teachers, I'm probably going to sound completely wrong. So what I do is this. I give them what the witnesses say, and they give their answers by with their arms. So you're looking here, okay? So I'm going to say something. The first one says, he's guilty because he's foreign. Now, if you think that's good evidence, you point that way. If you think it's bad evidence, you point that way. Let's see. Now, why haven't you got your hand up? You, come on. Yeah, no. So you see what I'm doing? Get everybody involved. Some pointing one way, some another. And some change. And then you, you talk about it. And you say why you think it might be good evidence or bad evidence. And uh, I, I mean, I really, that's what comes under the heading. Bad evidence and prejudice. Okay, the next one. My friend's mother's hairdresser's an arm Okay, so you know this is hearsay. This is just this is just gossip. You like it? Here. Well, maybe she did know, but there's no evidence that she did. I read it in the newspaper. He killed him. Now, is that good evidence? Let's say that your answer. Is it good evidence or bad evidence? Yeah, you see, now you're probably going to put your hand up there. Because you see, so some will say, you know, so I would myself, I would sort of be about here. The reason is this. Newspapers usually tell us the truth. If you say it rained yesterday, it did. Um, full of one the football cup, it probably did. Usually, newspapers do tell us the truth. But how do they know this? And also, newspapers don't always get it right. So I would say this was bad evidence, but it's worth discussing. I read the newspaper he killed my brother. Okay, right. His fingerprints match those on the murder weapon. Agree? Okay. Oh, good evidence. I'm looking down the middle of the road. Okay. Uh, right. Everyone thinks he did it. Well, mind you, usually everybody thinks something. It's true. My everybody thought the world was flat at that time. They were wrong. But usually, everybody thinks something. It's right. We all know exceptions. But how does everybody know they haven't looked at the evidence? So I, I think probably you would say that was, that was bad. Something like that, but it's wrong. The important thing is that they just have a knee jerk reaction. They think about it and try and explain why they think it's wrong. I just know you. I know in my heart. Intuition. Intuition is very, very powerful. And for many things, we can just base things on intuition. We have a very powerful brain. We can't always explain why we make decisions, but they're often very, very good decisions. But not always. Sometimes gut instinct or intuition can be very wrong. I know you had a motive to kill him. What do you think? Yeah, and I think you're going to point to good evidence. Not proof, but suggestive. So, humanists use the same rules of evidence, so we don't believe in ghosts, gods, and spirits, and miracles, and the effect of prayer, and afterlife. Supernatural. But the same rules as the jury would use in that trial. Okay, so that's just three examples of the sort of thing you might do going to school. And it's fun. It, it's really fun getting involved with the, the, the children. The RE teachers are, without exception, delightful people and very, very keen to learn about humanism. And I really enjoy giving in. In fact, my it's the teachers aren't to impress as much as the pupils. Obviously, that class is good, they know it. But the more we can persuade the teachers that we are a useful resource for coming in and talking about normative ethics, how do we know what's right and wrong without a Bible? In fact, I probably go and talk <coughs> more about that than about humanism, although, of course, I slip in a little bit of humanism as well. So, school of volunteering. To do it, you apply online. Uh, the training is very good. Um, and as you can see, you get detailed lesson plans and PowerPoint presentations, lots of videos, you have handouts, and you have class activities. So it is, it's, not, it's not a difficult thing to do, and it's very good post training support. The training is at weekends, uh, and when you're trained, you can do as little as you like. The first year, I just did two in the whole year. Now I'm doing about five or six schools a year, and that's not a big commitment. I'd like to do more of them, but busy with other things at the moment. Um, and you really, one really enjoys getting to know the schools and the RE teachers. <coughs> I enjoy
enjoy teaching about humanism, I enjoy getting better at teaching, I enjoy making a difference to the pupils, I enjoy raising the profile of humanism, walking the walk, not just talking the talk, and that's humanism in action.